We are beginning <clears throat> a study in, and I thought this was a funny sign. I, I collect these funny signs when I see them. Life is a puzzle. Look here, says the church, for the missing piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. So a good thought. We uh, begin with the minor prophets with the first one in the biblical um, structure is Hosea. And uh, this is uh, at a time when God was talk, having the prophets talk to Israel. <clears throat> and Hosea was a, a northern kingdom person, Israel. Um, it was Israel and then Judah when it divided up <clears throat> after Solomon. But uh, his message is God's love for Israel. And this is, this is that brokenhearted love where... In this case, the wife has, has departed to do what she wants and uh, leaving the, the family to, to itself. All right, looking at this then, we want to uh, look at part one, looking at Hosea the prophet. This is just sort of introduction. Uh, Hosea the man, his name, Hosea is Strong's 1954, Hoshea. Now, the meaning is salvation. Uh, perhaps broader uh, uh, Jehovah is salvation. The Yah at the end is, is the shortened version of Yahweh. Um, you find that this name shows up in various forms in English. Numbers 13, 16, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land and you remember that it was Joshua and Caleb that were the two good spies that came back full of faith saying, yeah, there's giants, but the bigger they are, the harder they fall, you know. Moses called Oshia, this is that same word, Hosea, Hoshia, also called Joshua, the King James margin reminds us, the son of Nun, and so he called Oshia Jehoshua, or Joshua, and um, so... Uh, a little change of pronunciation, evidently. But uh, we find Joshua, and then even Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua. And uh, so uh, Jehovah is salvation. His chronology, he preached to Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, let me be clear about that. The uh, northern kingdom was um, the former... Um, uh, it was the name of the entire thing, but when uh, they divided up after uh, Solomon, <clears throat> when Solomon's son said, you thought my father's taxes were tough, mine's going to be even more, and they knew he was no Solomon, um, Judah rebelled, and so they, they didn't put up a Berlin Wall or anything, but it, it was, a, uh, it was a, tough, a tough time. But he preached to the northern kingdom, and um, this was uh, where Jerusalem was. So they had the, they had the temple, the only temple in the world uh, to properly worship. So this is when, when they divided up the uh, uh, calf worship to replace Jehovah worship, took over down in Judea, but or in uh, Judah, but the. Uh, uh, more faithful people stayed in Judah than in Israel. Uh, so at the time of Isaiah and Micah, he preached, uh, when Isaiah and Micah preached to Judah, the southern kingdom, he was uh, there preaching to the uh, northern kingdom. He ministered during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, and he ministered under Jeroboam the second son of Joash of Israel. The total length of his service uh, the commentary I'm reading said uh, is probably about 50 years, though he admits that it's hard to describe this, it's hard to determine this, though some hold to 70 or 80 years of service. Now his domestic life, this becomes important, you'll see right away as we get into the text, that Hosea's home life is set forth more than any other prophet. This isn't, you know, like the... the uh, newspaper at the checkout line, you know, what's going on with this family, and the celebrities uh, 
kept before your eyes, both his wife and his children became signs and prophecies to Israel, Judah, and even further uh, down the line to the coming United Kingdom when they were reunited after the uh, Babylonian captivity. <clears throat> All right, let's move on then to Hosea the message. The basic outline is a fairly simple one. Chapters 1 to 3 describe Hosea's domestic experiences. Now, it is not just that, but uh, it is that plus uh, why that's important and why God ordered him to get married and ordered him to get married to a particular woman, particular kind of woman, and, uh, and then named his children for him. The uh, prophets were used by God. People looked at the prophets. What's going on with him? What's going on? You remember we've seen with Jeremiah that he, he shows up one day wearing a, a yoke like an ox, you know. And uh, he kind of rebelled about this. I don't want to wear a yoke. That's stupid, you know. God says, no, you got to do it. So he keeps on doing it. <clears throat> and people are saying, uh oh the prophet's acting weird. Something's, something's going on here. And uh, Ezekiel, you know, had to lay on his side. All these th weird things are going, oh, oh, we're in trouble. Look what the look what the prophet's doing. And they had to kind of figure it out, piece it together. Well, this is his whole his whole life and, and a sad sad life at, at that. Um, and then chapters 4 to 14 proclaim his prophetic messages. So as Amos preached repentance before the ultimate righteousness of God, we find Hosea preached unfailing love of God. Uh, this is one of those things where uh, a lot of our Reformed people seem to glory in God's judgment. Now, we should also glory in God's judgment <clears throat> because if he would not give judgment, then he would not be a righteous God or, or would, would be a weak concept of a God. I don't like it, but I'm not gonna can't do anything about it. No, he's the God who lets it go for a while, but then then uh, brings it to a halt. So um, the thing that we, you and I, need to recognize that even when God is dealing death bringing judgment on a nation, he's he's quite precise in this, and like a good parent who spanks not out of anger or frustration, uh, temper tantrum with the kids, but administers a spanking out of love. My wife and I determined right from the beginning that um, we would speak to our children, we would discipline them out of the sight line of everybody else, go to your room, wait for me there. And um, we did not use our hand or our belt. We didn't want these things of, of chastisement to be that closely associated with our person. Uh, we had the spanking stick. Found out that the little quarter inch dowel rods were just great instead of picking branches off the tree. Cut it in half, round off the corner so they weren't uh, sharp edges, and uh, and then we could put one in you know, each end of the house type of thing. So then we would bring the stick, you know, capital letters wrapped with barbed wire, you know, the <laughs> stick, and uh, bring it in, but we would speak first, and we'd say, what did you do? What did you do? Not why did you do it, but what did you do? And they would start telling us why they did it, you know. Well, he hit me first. And I uh, said, so, but what did you do? And when they finally had to say it, they recognized that they made a bad choice. And so then they were to bend over the bed, and God had conveniently made a place on a child's body that uh, is the proper place to receive the spanking. You don't break any bones. Uh, and you don't need actually need to leave any bruises. You just you you cause some pain, and the pain is associated with the wrongdoing. And this is a very valuable lesson. 
So, uh, after the spanking, and, and I often would say, I wish you didn't make me do this, but if I didn't do this, then God would spank me. But afterwards then, we would take them, hold them in our arms, give them a hug, say, I love you, and I don't want you to do this anymore. Don't make me do this anymore. So this is what Hosea is doing with um, God looking at his family. If you look at the quote, um, the, the Bible promise uh, in the bulletin today from Hosea, you see the aching of God's heart as his wife Israel, uh, spiritually uh, his wife, has, um, has left him brokenhearted. So the unfailing love of God, even with betrayal. We come then to point B, Hosea the book, and so we begin. All right, the introduction is, uh, as I said, chapters uh, 1 to 3. Only five verses in chapter 3, but they're important verses, as we'll see. Let's look then at chapter 1. The date, <clears throat> Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, The word of the Lord came unto jo uh, Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, in, um, in the northern kingdom. Now, there is no final determinative chart, evidently, but one chart that I would looked up shows the years, if you're trying to understand how far back this goes, Uzziah 769 to 733, B.C. goes, you know, the larger to the smaller, Ahaz 733 to 727, and Hezekiah 727 to 698. In Israel, Jeroboam II reigned from 784 to 748. So all of this uh, shows you that we're in the uh, six, seven hundreds of, um, uh, before Christ. The second verse, we find the command to marry. I don't know whether he was just a slow mover and didn't know many girls. I don't know what was going on here. But uh, the beginning of the word of, of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife, a wife of whoredoms, of prostitution, and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. Now this uh, introduces uh, something that ha has been said earlier than uh, the book of Hosea, but is repeated all the way through, even to the, uh, the great uh, harlot of the book of the Revelation. These are, are uh, spiritual harlotry. Now, his wife would go, would play the harlot. She wasn't, um, that was not her profession. He, he didn't find her at a, a house of harlotry. Uh, she was not a harlot, as the children were not uh, children of harlots at, at, at the uh, beginning of things. So he married a woman who would leave him. And you see the, I don't know what, the character of these prophets that, you know, Abraham is told to slay his beloved son. And he says, you know what you're doing, so, you know. Um, New Testament tells us that he believed that God would raise him from the dead after he stabbed him to death and burned his body, you know. Um, but uh, God had a different plan, of course. But God immediately put him into a life of trouble. And God says to him, your wife's going to leave you, but this is what I want, because... This will be a sign, and you know how people will talk about such things, that will spread all the way through, and um, your, your message will be a, a very powerful message, that you, Israel, uh, looking at me, pitying me, pity yourselves, for you have become my wife of harlotry. So uh, this is what's going on with him. God allowed no debate. He did give him the reason, 
that his marriage was to illustrate God's sense of turmoil, God's sense of turmoil with the nation leaving him, um, the people of the land, and uh, that's kind of a vague concept, for the land hath committed great whoredom, that sounds like north and south kingdom, uh, the whole land is the promised land, because of their spiritual harlotry. This is uh, New Testament, James says, um, you adulterers and adulteresses, writing to Christian people, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. It says you are playing the harlot. You ought to be the faithful, devoted, obedient wife. And you're not. You are getting your fun time from the world. And he says this is just not right. And, uh, you know, just not... Uh, James not mincing words. He was a very, very strict Christian himself. We come then to the fulfillment of the commandment in verse 3. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. So, in very short words, he obeyed and started a family. Well, then we come now to the prophecy of Jezreel. Now, if we're going pretty quickly through this, it's fairly easy to understand these things. But now we're going to take some time to review Old Testament history. So those of you who read through your Bible every year, as we all should, um, the, um, uh, these names will be familiar and the stories will be familiar. <clears throat> Hosea 1, 4, and 5. Here's the prophecy. So he buried him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. That was a place name in Israel. For yet a little while I will avenge, the Hebrew, King James Margin says the Hebrew here is to visit. The visitation of God is not, uh, hi, I just came over for tea and crumpets. This is, uh, this is to visit them with their, their wickedness. So they translated it avenge. The blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Uh, if you've ever heard of somebody calling somebody a Yehu, this is the guy. <laughs> uh, passionate. Uh, they, uh, at one point they see him riding into the king, and he says, Why, driving the horse furiously. Why, that, it, it, we can't see who it is, but anybody driving a horse like that, that must be Jehu. You know, so he was known for his fast cars. <laughs> Well, the horses anyway. So upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel, and it shall come to pass that that day I will break the bow, the military power of Israel, in the valley of Jezreel. So place, name, and historical spot all in one. Let's uh, take some time then because it mentions about the house of Jehu. Now, why was God? Why did God have a, a bone to pick with Jehu? So the story of Jezreel um, begins with Ahab and Jezebel. You remember, uh, everybody knows the name Jezebel, and Ahab, the evil king, brought this uh, Baal worshiper uh, into his life. This is 1 Kings 21, 7 to 15. The story is that there was a garden by a man uh, in the property of a man named uh, Naboth. Is that right? Am I remembering right? And um, Ahab says, I really love your garden. I want to buy it. And he says, not for sale. Not for sale. And so uh, Ron Hamilton, Patrick Pirate, has a song about pouting. And it's a story of Ahab sitting there outing, I didn't get what I wanted. Jezebel comes in and says, what's going on? So Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? She says, yeah, you're, you're a poor thing, aren't you? Except, you know, you're the king. You can do whatever you want. And arise, eat bread, let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, Naboth, Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, 
and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in, the, in his city, dwelling with Naboth. What did the letter say? She wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast, what a holy thing to do, and set Naboth on high among the people. And uh, the Hebrew literally in top, in the top of the people. So it doesn't mean on top of their heads, but you know, set them up where everybody can see. And set two men, sons of Belial, sons of wickedness, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him, that he may die. Get rid of Naboth with a holy wrath. They didn't burn people to the stake. There, but. So the men of the city received this word from the king, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. You know, you'd think there would be some righteous man who says, well, I'm not going to do that. They both said, nice, nice man. But they did even as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast, sat Naboth on high among the people, as if to honor him. And there came in two men, children of Belial. Uh, this is not their father, but this is their character of evil. And sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. And the elders, in holy horror, uh, turned their back on Naboth and said, Carry him out. They carried him forth out of the city, stoned him with stones, that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, she shed no tears, she had no grief. She smiled, she said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Wicked, wicked woman. Well, God quickly condemned Ahab's sin. Uh, not by Hosea, but uh, at that time. 1 Kings 21, 17 to 19. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet King Ahab, king of Israel which is in Samaria. Behold, and he knew where uh, the king lived, but uh, saying Ahab is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. So he just got there, and he's just glorying in his possession. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession you see here that what he allowed his wife to do, God called him on it. He had to answer for that. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, in that city, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. You're a dead man. <clears throat> you don't know when, you don't know how but you're a dead man. Now, God's condemnation hit Ahab first, and then his wife, but when Ahab determined to retrieve Ramoth Gilead from Syria, he went the rest of the day looking around, how am I going to die, and nothing happened, so pff, you know, Elijah the Tishbite, you know, what does he know? So, uh, he determined, however, to retrieve Ramoth Gilead from Syria, he went to war. But he had been warned of God that um, by a prophet that, you know, he got, he got the king of uh, Judah to go with him. And the king of Judah says, we ought to see what God says about this. So um, they call uh, Micaiah, the only, only good priest around. And uh, they, they warn Micaiah, you know, uh, you, you, you treat him nice, you know, so he gets up there. He says, what do you think about our plan to take Ramoth Gilead? He says, go forth, everything's fine, be best of God. And so King Ahab says, no, 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 how many times do I have to tell you? Only tell me the truth from God. 
And he says, you will die. <laughs> and um, so anyway, uh, Ahab says, huh, well, uh, hey, I got an idea. So uh, you uh, keep your whatever battle crown on and you look like a king. And I'm going to look like the everyday warrior. And so he just wears plain clothes. So nobody knows who he is. See. And uh, so in the battle, the uh, people of Ramoth Gilead said, only aim at the king. He killed the head and the snake is dead. You know, So they'll um, uh, aim at him. But the only king they found was the uh, king of, of Judah. So he says, let me out of here. So he takes, takes off running. And um, you can't find the other king. So we come to 1 Kings 22, 34 to 37. Look at 20, 34. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture, which this is in his simplicity. He's, maybe his frustration, I don't know. He says, can't find a king. Ah, and he just shoots a bow, shoots his arrow out. And he goes, right to where God wanted it. And smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. The Hebrew jo the joints and the breastplate. So a place in the armor. This arrow not only hits him, but hits him in exact the right place. And it goes through the armor, between the pieces of armor, and, uh, and stabs into him. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Uh, made sick, you know, I'm, 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 I'm dying. And the battle increased, ascended that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst, into the bosom of the chariot. Uh, this is that blood that the dogs would lick up. And there went out a proclamation throughout the host going down the sun saying, every man to his city, every man to his own country, so the king died and was brought or came to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. So uh, this uh, happens <clears throat> where uh, at, at Jezreel, the northern part of his, his place where he had that garden, uh, that was where the blood went out. Well, then God's condemnation of... Um, uh, hit uh, Jezebel. And again, we have a long thing to read. How do we do? Okay. <clears throat> I seem to be missing a uh, piece of paper here. Anyway, Elijah the, the, uh, uh, Elisha, the prophet, called one of the children of the prophets. They have a school of the prophets. So one of them said unto him, Gird up thy loins. That's they had these long flowing things, so they'd reach between the legs, grab the between their legs, and grab the back part of the robe and pull it up and tuck it into their belt. So now they're wearing their gym shorts, you see, um, so that they could run without tripping over the robes. Gird up thy loins, take this box of oil in thine hand, go to Ramoth Gilead. So you remember that was where the Ahab died. And when thou comest thither, look out there. Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. And go in, and this is how you knew. They, they didn't have first and last names, generally. So this is that Jehu, who is the son of Jehoshaphat, who was the son of Nimshi. And go in and make him arise up from among his brethren, and carry him to an inner chamber, leave his <coughs> group, Hebrew, the chamber, inner chamber, to a secret closet area, Take the box of oil, pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. <laughs> Run out of there fast. Things are going to happen. So the young man, even the young man of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. Jehu is the captain. Jehu said, Unto which of all of us? And he said, to thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil in his head and said unto him, thou, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. 
and thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. She was the one who was putting them to death and uh, honoring the prophet, the prophets of Baal and the god Baal. Baal means Lord. They just called him Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that is a little boy, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, just cut off. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, the place where that garden was, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So, although chosen of God to execute God's judgment, Jehu continue, committed crimes. So he becomes a man that is guilty and um, yet, uh, so what have I done with the other page? Well, I'll read it off the thing. All right. So one of the things he did is he killed the king of Judah. Um, there was nothing in that mandate about that, you see. But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled away from uh, of the garden house. Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Ibleim, in case you wanted to know exactly where that was. And he fled to Megiddo and died there, and his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem, buried him in the sepulcher with his fathers in the city of David in Jerusalem, or Bethlehem. Uh, to finish the condemnation of God, he drove the people of Samaria to behead 70 sons of Ahab. He took it upon himself to kill many of Judah, which does, wasn't in the command. 2 Kings 10, 12-14. Um, and he arose and departed, came to Samaria, as he was at the shearing house, which is literally the house of the shepherds binding sheep, in the way, Jehu met with, or found, the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah. So these are just the brothers of the king that he killed. Who are ye? And they answered, we are the brethren of Ahaziah. We go down to salute, or to the peace of the children of the king and the children, the children of the queen. And he said, take them alive, and they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men, forty-two men, neither left he any of them. So this was unnecessary, but he's, uh, so he's killing off the, the headship of Judah as well as Israel. All right, let's move on. We have another there. Now, this leads us to understand the principle of Jehu, the principle that God is using here, because the question is, wait a minute, I thought he was the chosen of God to do this stuff. So why is God bringing a judgment by this child Jezreel on the house of Jehu? Well, this is a principle that you and I need to understand. God did commend Jehu for his obedience. 2 Kings 10.30 the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So you have four generations that I guarantee will sit on the throne. So how could God commend a man driven by pride? Well, Habakkuk, the prophet, asked the same question of God, when God revealed to him that God would use wicked Babylon to chastise rebellious Israel. Habakkuk 1, 12 and 13. He says, let me get this straight. Art thou not from everlasting, O God, my God, mine holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, hast, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O mighty God, or O rock, Thou hast established or founded them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity or grievance. Wherefore, why therefore 
Lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he. He says, granted, our nation is bad, but they're not as bad as Babylon. Now, how can you use that? Use them to hurt us. I don't, I don't understand that, he says. Well, God would explain to him that after he used Babylon for his purposes, he would also deal with them for their sins. Now, there are some things, especially in the area of judgment, that you wouldn't find the average peace-loving neighbor that's willing to jump up and start executing people of his neighbors. God often chooses people whose, let's say, their business is just killing people. God would use that. So it was with Jehu. Proverbs 16, 4, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, a lot of people just suppose the day of evil is when they, when they, are, they are punished. But I think it's broader than that. Here he says, The day of evil needs an evil man to get into the work. Jesus spoke of the prophesied task of Judas Iscariot. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it has been determined. It will happen. I will be betrayed. That was prophesied of God. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. In other words, the wicked man does a wicked thing, and that is used of God to advance his cause. But he has to answer for his sin. The fact that God put the evil man to work to do his bidding doesn't mean it excuses the wicked man, you see. Now we come to the end of the kingdom of Israel and the breaking of Israel's military power in Jezreel. All right, Through the, uh, though the northern kingdom was prospering at the time, Hosea forewarned of the end of Jehu's dynasty that fourth generation, and the destruction of the northern kingdom in the valley of Jezreel. That was, we've already looked at it, but it shall come to pass at that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, 40 years later, this was fulfilled. 2 Kings 15, 8 to 12. In the 30 and 8th year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel in Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Knowing that the temple was in the northern kingdom, he gave them the golden calf worship, which he said, really, it's just as good. It's, it's really the same, you know. But he made Israel sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the act of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. And the king of Israel, uh, Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria. This is the, the entire end of Israel. He carried away Israel into Assyria. Before the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrians took the northern kingdom away and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Because, and this was not the king of Assyria's motive, but it was God's motive, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded and would not hear them nor do them. Do we have any more? Is that it? Okay. We're back to the life as a puddle. All right. Well, that timing worked out pretty well. <clears throat> Put these things together. Just wonder how it's going to work out. A lot of reading of the uh, of the Old Testament scripture there. But uh, this, and we just got to the first son. So we've got uh, a daughter to deal with next time, Lord willing. All right. Comments or questions? We, uh, we're not going to have a problem 
understanding that God will move upon and put circumstances together to use wicked people in their wickedness to accomplish his will. To where even um, the uh, wickedness is overturned, is, is overcome. Like the killing of Jesus. It was just pure wickedness. And yet it accomplished one of the great goals of God from the beginning, uh, right after time began. Well, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with prayer. I'll go on a search for my final page. What in the world? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look to your word of God to begin the study of the minor prophets with Hosea, who in the midst of your anger, in the midst of your judgment, in the midst of bringing tragedy upon the very nations that you put into the land, keeps reciting the fact that it's a matter of love, that the judgment comes when we re refuse to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Help us, Father, to leave this place today understanding that you require this of us. This is what we're supposed to do. This is where we are to be. We ask, Father, that you might so work that our hearts might be challenged to dedicate ourselves every morning, all anew, to do the work of love this day. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.